he could probably feel me trying to choke back the tears. I don't think, um, I think God created me with more emotion than nervousness. I'm not sure which one I prefer. Anyways, hi everyone. For those of you that don't know me, I'm uh, Brandon Motts. We've been attending this church for, see, no reason. There's no reason. <laughs> So bear with me as it might come up a time or two, but we've been attending this church for seven plus years and, and love to call this uh, church our home and, and uh, just love to worship with you on each Sunday. Um, over the past several weeks, uh, we've had the privilege, privilege of hearing different people speak. And uh, Pastor Rob, as Scott mes mes has mentioned, is taking some holiday time. Three Sundays ago, uh, Jamil shared and uh, his testimony of conversion from the Muslim religion to Christianity and what a powerful message of freedom that was. Um, having traveled to Lebanon several times and having had the opportunity to preach at that Baptist church in Beirut where Jamil called his home for many years, I've enjoyed the powerful experience of participating in a worship service where I didn't understand a word and they didn't understand me, quite frankly. Being able to worship, pray together with like-minded believers without verbal communication is something I greatly enjoy and will never, never forget those experiences. I've also had the uh, privilege of presenting a sermon with a translator. Uh, my translator, thankfully, was Anzi. Now, um, for those of you that have never had that opportunity, it's both very terrifying and very exciting. The exciting part is that you are completely at the mercy of the translator. The terrifying part is that you are completely at the mercy of the translator. You have to trust that what you're saying is being presented in such a way, uh, in, in the way that you intended it to be. And there's a good chance that the translator maybe even knows more than you, which in my case is a really good chance, and is able to say things more eloquently or, or um, differently and, and present the message a little different. But since English is not my first language, I'm still trying to figure out what that language is. Um, I've asked Anzi if he would be willing to translate for me today, to which he graciously has declined. So all that to say, if what I'm about to say doesn't make sense, I'm sorry, but it must have got lost in translation. For those of you that are in my small group, yes, I am being sarcastic. We are mostly excited to look forward to the year, to this year, the year 2024, and it seems like just yesterday we were getting back into the post-holiday routine of 2023 and the same time, and at the same time uttering words like, how fast has time flown by? Today's sermon is simply titled, Time. I was texting one of my good friends uh, during preparation of this sermon, this is a this is a funny part. I don't know why I'm getting emotional, but um, asking for prayer as I prepared, and my friend replied, "Absolutely, I'll be praying." He then followed that text with some random meme about meme about you got this. Always a source of positive encouragement, and that never lacking "I got your back" commitment only a friend can give. Then he asked if I had figured out what I'd be preaching on. I quickly replied, yes, I'll be preaching on time. To this he replied, time is short, just like this sermon. Sorry, Dennis, it was too good not to use. Yes, how fast time has flown by. Do you ever take a step back and wonder about this? Why? Why does time fly so fast? Why do we seem to be constantly fighting the clock? How often do we feel like we are just on a hamster wheel with no real purpose and don't really know how to get off? And so, in so many ways, time has just become a little generic, as it were. The, busy we, the busier we get, the harder it is to slow down. Yet we know that each day has 24 hours, 1,440 minutes, 86,400 seconds. And every one of them is a precious gift of God and from God. Time is something we feel we never have enough of, 
yet we give it away so easily. Someone once said, time is free, but it's priceless. You can't own it, but you can use it. You can't keep it, but you can spend it. Once you've lost it, you'll never get it back. Time is something we each have. For most of us, for most if not all of us, it's not just, or it has become just a part of life. We don't often think of it in the way that I believe God has intended us to use it. As a farmer, I, I know this feeling all too well, this feeling of time. Calving is coming up here soon, and I want to take the time to make sure the mama cows are in good shape. Do I have the right feed in front of them to provide proper nutrition they need? Do I have the proper supplies for calving, etc.? Once calving is over, or possibly in the midst of it, then there will be seeding, one of the more crucial times in the growing season. As the calendar has changed to the new year, my mind has automatically turned to seeding preparation. Over the past couple weeks, I've had several different meetings looking at new products I could possibly use. I've checked around for the right seed needed. I've shopped for the best fertilizer prices. <coughs> I've even purchased some new-to-me equipment to make the growing season a little easier and more efficient. Then we wait and we pray for rain. And we put a tremendous amount of faith in what we planned and prepared for. Once the growing season is over, it's time to bring in the harvest. This is a favorite time on our farm. All the family gets involved with running equipment and it brings out a camaraderie that is hard to match. Those of you who have been involved in harvest or, or any farming operation understand the importance of timing with harvest specifically. The reality that the clock keeps ticking and often an intense pace of work that can be exhausting. Between weather, breakdowns, different stages of crop, things can get stressful in a real hurry. The reality of time being an asset as a farmer is very real, and so is the faith that we put in God. Zoomed out, I can paint a pretty good picture of how it should all look and how it should go. Yet each day comes and goes without the ability to influence the speed at which it passes. Days turn into weeks, weeks, months, and so on. And with it, the all too often forgotten reality sorry, and with it the all too often forgotten reality that each day is precious. How often we get caught up in that passing of time without stopping to reflect on its true meaning. In my life there's, there always seems to be different themes or truths that I come to realize or more truthfully come to lean on at different times. In its own way, the busyness of life I lead contributes to these themes and truths, or at least the application of them. Some of them come with a touch of hindsight and others with more foresight than I deserve. In either case, I'm so thankful for the prompting of the Holy Spirit in my life in these ways. One of these truths has been that of time. Not only the use of it, even though that is very important, but more the reality of the truth of time and how we are called as children of God to live in it. Now, there are many different ways that we can think of time, and I'm sure some are coming to mind, but we know that time can bring healing. Even though we try very quick to forgive, things happen that leave deep scars. Releasing to God the details and humbly making things right oftentimes are just the beginning of the healing journey. We all too often need time to do the rest. For me, more often than not, uh, time brings humility. I get caught up in the moment, run my mouth, and allow my anger to lash out at a person, often my own family. I get so caught up that I argue my point, make statements that are hard to believe and cause damage that is hard to recover from. Thankfully, time brings humility. 
Often it starts with conviction, which I all too often confront with pride, making excuses for my actions, mumbling why I did what I did, and once again stating how I am right. Yet in God's grace, I come around to the real truth, allowing time to humble me. The reality that if we don't lay aside our pride and replace it with humility, God often, God all too often allows us to be humiliated. What does the, Proverbs say, or the writer of Proverbs say in, in Proverbs 16, verse 8? Pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. Time has been a reference since the beginning of creation. God has created our world and us within the precision of time, which can be found in Genesis 1 and 2. In fact, within the story of creation, God, in a way, outlines time, or rather displays his power through time, as we read in that story. With each day of creation, it's stated, it is good. The order of what was created and the time it took to do so was good. After all, it was crafted by the master himself. We have been created with order. This is truth that is all too often overlooked. God is above time. He created it. He delights in taking time to make his glory known. At creation, God did not speak the world into existence all at once. He took time to, act, to delight in the act of creating. For six days he worked and then he rested on the seventh. When God spoke his word, he did not give it all at once. He took time revealing his word to the prophets and apostles through many ages. And when Adam fell and God promised the coming Savior, the seed of the woman who would crush the head of the serpent, as we read in, in Genesis 3.15, he did not send him right away. God took time to prepare the way. Furthermore, Jesus came at the right time to die for the ungodly. And in Romans 5, verse 6, it says, You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. It is with that very foundation that he shows us the importance of time. Not always the seconds and minutes that tick by, but rather the use of his time for his glory. Now the reality is that none of us will ever be able to master the perfection in which we have been created, which is why I'm so thankful for the cross, that Christ died for the ungodly. For you and I, that bridge, the cross, that bridge between the sin and the Savior. The first point I'd like to make this morning is God asks us to take time to grow in our faith. Now there's a unique correlation throughout scripture between how to live, i.e. the spiritual obligation that Christ has called us to and the way we are to use our time. We see this outlined in James 4. If you have your Bibles, I invite you to read with me there. James 4, it, the first part of the passage talks strongly about personal quarrels and fights. It outlines the sinful reality of life without a Savior. Picking up in verse 3, When you ask, do you not receive? Because you ask with wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. Spend, referencing the waste of time. James then carries on with more truth in verse 4. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world means enmity with, against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. The truth at the end of time reveals the past. Or more simply put, time always tells the truth, which we will unpack a little later on. Whether it is here on earth or that moment when we meet our Savior, truth will be re revealed. Picking up in verse 5 of James 4. Or do you not think that Scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the Spirit he has caused to dwell in us? 
but God gives us more grace. That is why scripture says God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. He then calls us to the higher standard that I spoke of earlier. He calls us to humbly submit. We see this in application in Ephesians 6 when Paul calls us to put on the armor of God. I'm just going to read that as a reminder. Ephesians 6 verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's scheme. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of every evil in, heaven, in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your guard, and after, after you have done everything, to stand. Note he doesn't say, if the day of evil comes, but when the day of evil comes. Stand firm then in verse 14 with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. And with your feet fitted, or sorry, in addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And pray in spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert. Always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Why do you think Paul has outlined this so clearly for us and for our daily living? Well, I can say with confidence that it has nothing to do with rituals. These have been replaced with the new covenant. In the same confidence, I can say it is not merely, or not meant to merely just be a spoken thing, something that we wake up uttering every morning hoping it sticks. No, it's an application, or rather an action that we are deliberately to take each day for our protection. I believe at the root, Satan is trying to rob us of time. He is trying to take from us the very time that God created in his grace as we read in James 4, 6. God asks us to take time each day to ready ourselves for the battle that we know will come. Take time to grow in your faith. <coughs> the second point I'd like to make is time always tells the truth. In simple terms, we get out of life what we put into life. But what if we started viewing life through the lens of time telling the truth? At the root of it, I believe scripture makes it clear. <coughs> Excuse me. If anyone then knows the good they ought to do it and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. In James 4 verse 17. If anyone is willing to waste the time that our lovingly Heavenly Father has given, this is sin. <coughs> Sorry. It's silly to say, but at times we need to be patient and allow God to reveal the truth through time. I found this mostly to be true in relationships. Time does show us who our friends are. I'd like to read a passage from Ephesians again, uh, back a few pages to Ephesians chapter 5. Starting at verse 1. You follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But among you there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality or any kind of impurity or of greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be uh, obs obscenity, foolish talk, coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. 
For of this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a person as an idolater, <coughs> has ever inherited the kingdom of Christ and of God. Sorry, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one decide, oh my goodness, let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not be partners with them. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light. For the fruit of the light consists of all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord, having nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expo expose them. It is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret, but everything exposed by the light becomes visible, and everything that is illuminated becomes light. This is why it is said, wake up, sleeper, Rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Be careful, then, how you live, not unwise, but wise, making the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil. They're not do therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. But everything exposed by light becomes visible, and everything that is illuminated becomes a light. At the end of time, Christ's light will shine on our lives, revealing the truth of the past. Assuming we fully understand this concept, I would ask, how would it reflect your life today? Would you change anything? How about those sin struggles you keep shoving in the closet? Or that thing we know to be a waste of time, but do it anyways? <clears throat> or the anger, manipulation, selfish desires that we know are wrong, but don't really care. What about putting the concept of what about putting the concept of time always telling the truth up against the fruits of the spirit? Whatever is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self control. How would your life look then? How would my life look then? So many analogies come to mind when I think about this, including the one in Matthew 13 where Jesus talks about the sower and the seed, a very familiar passage. And I encourage you to take time to read Matthew 13 as I was just reading through it this week, just the amount of references to building God's kingdom is, is, uh, is awesome. So if you, if you have time, I encourage you to read Matthew 13 this week. But to change it up, I'd like to talk a little bit about cars. Not the movie, but the vehicle. Most of you own one, or will at some point in your lives. Some of you will baby this said car its entire life and probably or possibly never part with it. For you up-and-coming car buyers, those are the ones to look for, just as a side note. Some will say, I bought it to use it, and so I shall, and the end result will be a well-used car. Some will not care at all and beat it to death, never servicing it, never washing it, never caring what the end result might look like. But one day we're going to have to sell that car, or somebody's going to have to sell that car. Based on these three scenarios, do you think there will be a difference at the point of sale with how you treated the car? Even if the buyer doesn't know, simply based on the condition of the car, he or she can tell how it was treated. <coughs> or at times, if the car shows well, it won't take long till we understand exactly what the mechanical state is. You will get out of it what you put in. So I ask myself this question, does wasting time then grieve the Holy Spirit? I think it does. There's a, there's a, th this concept has caused me, caused me to think back in my life. And I wasn't born in 1986, so uh, it's even older than that. But um, 
I don't know why I went down that rabbit trail. But growing up in a family of nine boys, it wasn't often that I could get away with much slacking. Looking back now the then innocent accuser wasn't always so innocent. Anyone here sympathize with that? There was, however, the odd time that I would get left alone for an overnighter or a weekend. Now, as you can imagine, with such a large family, we always had lots of chores. There were the cows to feed, at times the cows to milk, the chickens to feed, the eggs to gather, the eggs to wash, some 150 plus eggs a day, the large garden to weed, the, wa the garden to water, the grass to mow, the dishes to wash, the house to clean, and the list goes on and on. And it wasn't like everyone would pitch in leading up to the said time away to make my life easier. Nope, not a chance. Life would just carry on like normal. So being such a responsible young man, I would, that was supposed to be funny, I would uh, carefully measure my freedom time against the said task list, calculate each task and assign a, assign a timeline, then take whatever time would be remaining in the day and use it however I would see fit. Yeah, not many of you believe that. Uh, that was not the truth. I would sleep in, I would do the bare minimum to keep things alive, then prepare a small feast of, to my liking. Don't tell my parents, by the way. Then maybe have a nap or watch a movie or do whatever I wanted. This would go really well until the reality of time and deadlines would sink in. Most of the time this would occur at the 11th hour, of which there would be no possible way I could recover. Left with no choice, I'd foolishly rush the weeding, rush the egg washing, cracking or breaking far too many in the process, and so on and so forth. I knew the wrath that would be waiting for me from my father. Yes, it was my father who would bring the wrath. I knew the punishment for laziness, yet I still chose it. And the time I wasted told the truth. I'd love to stand here and say that those were years that I learned to never repeat, but sadly that's not true. Time is short. There is no clear way to put it. The clock is ticking. Eternity is waiting. The reality that we all know is that 10 out of 10 people will face eternity, whatever that looks like for them. Now it's sad when we lose people who are close to us but it's a reality that we each must face. This isn't a new thing, the truth. This truth is as old as time itself. God has created each of us with the end in mind. Mark 13 reminds us that the ultimate time crunch is, crunch is coming. Mark 13, verse 32 and 33 read, but about that day or hour, no one knows. Not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard. Be alert. You do not know when that time will come. There is no way to predict it. But that is the only time crunch that will truly matter. And as we stand before our Creator, we will be judged with the final judgment. The one that tells the ultimate truth. There's no escaping this. Uh, 2 Peter 2 uh, brings this to light, and I'd like to read that. 2 Peter 2, verse 4. <coughs> For if God did not spare the angels when they sinned, but sent them to hell, putting them in the chains of darkness to be held for judgment, if he did not spare the ancient world when he brought the flood on its ungodly people, but protected Noah, a preacher of righteousness, and seven others, if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah by burning them to ashes and made them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly, and if he rescued Lot, a righteous man, who was distressed by the depraved conduct of the lawless, for that righteous man living among them day after day was tormented in his righteous soul by the lawless deeds he saw and heard, if this is so, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to hold the unrighteousness unrighteous for punishment on the day of judgment. This is especially true of those who follow the corrupt desire of the flesh and despise authority. 
time is ultimately in God's hands. He calls each of us not to dilly-dally around, but to get serious. At the end of our time, what is the truth that we would like to be revealed? The final point I'd like to make is something that I know I don't do well. Something that I'd like to blame on the fast pace of life or the different curveballs that life has a way of throwing our direction. But the truth is that I just don't set enough time, I just don't set aside time to abide. So my third point is this, take time to abide. We talked about the reality that God is sovereign over time. He's intentional in crafting time for his own glory. And he calls on us to be good stewards of that time. All our moments and days are gifts from him. We are to value time and the use of time we have wisely. Before Moses prays, This prayer in Psalm 90, verse 12, that reads, So teach us to number our days that we may gain the heart of wisdom. He first takes time to reflect or abide on the truth that God God is and the sovereignty in which he rules our lives. Psalm 90, verse 1. Lord, you have been our dwelling place through all generations. Before the mountains were born, you brought forth the earth and the world. From everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You return man to dust, saying, Return, O sons of mortals, for in your sight a thousand years are but a day that passes, or a watch of the night. You whisk them away in their sleep. They are like the new grass of the morning, in the morning that springs up new, but by evening it fades and withers. For we are consumed by your anger and terrified by your wrath. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins, in the light of your presence. For all our days declined in your fury. We finish our years with a sigh. The length of our days is 70 years or 80 if we are strong. Yet their pride is but labor and sorrow, for they quickly pass and we fly away. Who knows the power of your anger or your wrath? matches the fear you are due. So teach us to number our days that we may present a heart of wisdom. Return, O Lord, how long will it be? Have compassion on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your loving devotion that we may sing for joy and be glad all our days. Make us glad as many days as you have afflicted us for as many years as we have seen evil. May your work be shown to your servants and your splendor to their children. May the favor of the Lord our God rest upon us. Establish for us the work of our hands. Yes, establish the work of our hands. Teach us, Lord. Teach us, Lord, to number our days. Not only that, but to live each day with a desire to grow closer to the Creator. This is our purpose. A few Sundays ago, Pastor Paul Spade talked about the end of time here on earth and the 